thanks, thanks very much. Just before, before we get going, to establish, as it were, the ground rules, essentially there are not many rules at all. Um, um, it, it's, it's based on the radio programme, but the structure of what we're going to do is based on the radio programme called um, Any Questions on Radio 4. Who, who's heard of it? <laughs> Who hasn't heard of it? Who hasn't heard of it but doesn't quite like to own up? <laughs> You're very welcome. Who, who hasn't heard of it doesn't quite want to say so in public? <laughs> Oh, you're much too smart. Usually several more people put up their hands when I do that. <laughs> anyway, um, and the form is, we've got questions which have been handed in to us. And there may be some coming through uh, uh, by that means as well, uh, uh, um, if we get them from the webcams, because there are anyone who's on their web now or accessing it through Brace can be listening to what we are doing and, and responding to it in the... In the, in the, the the modern technical way. Um, and that means we've got about six or seven <coughs> questions. It doesn't sound very many, but by the time we've had proper discussion about it, you'll see how fast the time should go. Um, I'm going to play it backwards and forwards between our panel here and the audience. So any comments you may have or points you want to pick up of agreement or disagreement or thoughts that come into your mind as a consequence of what you've heard, just do a show of hands. We've got a microphone up at the, up at the back there. The blue check shirt uh, is, well, he's not the microphone, you know what I mean. Um, and, and we were discussing this before, because he's the only microphone, depending on how hard you want to make him work, we could have a hand up there, followed by a hand over there, followed by a hand over there, in which case he'll be rushing around, but um, we'll manage one way or, or <coughs> another. Uh, and I, I'm going to, I won't ask the panel necessarily, all the members of the panel, to respond to every question. I shall start with one or two, come back to the audience, go back to them for points they might want to add. Um, and the, just to introduce briefly, I think you've all seen the, the, the biogs of our panellists. So just in summary, um, going from, from here, Mara Conway first is Associate Professor of Neurochemistry and Dementia at UA here. And she she's funded at the moment, partially at least, if not completely, partially or completely by Brace? Partially. Partially com uh, by, by, by Brace. Um, Steve Webb next door is Liberal Democrat MP. He's been, uh, had the neighbouring constituency since 2010. He's Minister of Pensions, for Pensions in the Coalition Government. He went to Oxford University and studied like so many politicians do, philosophy, politics and economics. And then, to my astonishment, I really dropped the politics part because he wasn't very good at it. <laughs> uh, which is a measure of how important it is not to study politics to get yourself a good seat. Um, <laughs> He was uh, at Bath University, which there is a university just down the road called Bath, uh, um, as Professor of Social Policy, and he's been in the House since 1997. Um, then we have next door to Steve Webb, Zara, Zara Ross, who was born in Northern Ireland, studied at Queen's University. Um, she's now Head of Care at the St Monica Trust, where she's been for 12, 13 years? 13 years. And her own mother died as a result of vascular uh, dementia and her principal strong commitment is to improving standards and models of care uh, within the charity sector than which given all the prevailing figures there can be nothing more important. Um, Seth Love uh, was at the University of Witwatersrand in the medical school in South Africa. Um, he has been at Bristol University uh, as professor of neuropathology for quite some time now. How long? Uh, since 1995. <coughs> since 1995. He's president of the British Neuropathological Society and his, his work is supported amongst others um, by BRACE and it's focused largely on Alzheimer's uh, disease and the related causes of dementia. Um, he, he is incidentally a fan of, of Terry Pratchett's novels which takes me to just a couple of opening thoughts. Um, against a, a background of, I think, some 820,000 people who are currently uh, diagnosed with dementia, um, it is projected that, well, at the moment, one in 50 of us between the ages of 65 and 70 are so diagnosed, and one in five of the over 80s. Um, two people I've known who quite well, one very well, one not so well, who were diagnosed in their 60s. One was a great journalist who um, was renowned for the extraordinary range of language at his disposal, which made him a great columnist called Bernard Levin, who succumbed to Alzheimer's. Um, the other uh, uh, delivered two, three years ago the 
the Richard Dimbleby lecture on BBC One, Terry Pratchett. Um, in fact, when he came into the studio before he did it, it was a beautifully written essay which um, uh, looked at the experience of having Alzheimer's, being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and then went on to argue, which made it quite controversially subsequently followed up in the film. He argued a very strong case, uh, incidentally, for the right to die. But it was, it was what was interesting, he came in and here was this wonderfully articulate individual, and he said, I don't think I can deliver this lecture myself. He said it in the afternoon, I, I, I happened to be introducing it that, that year. And, and, he, and he got Terry Rob um, Tony Robinson to deliver the lecture, and he sat beside, and we thought, oh, this is going to be very difficult. He's sitting there in silence, and Tony is delivering the, the, the speech. And it, uh, Tony Robinson did it so well that within a few moments you felt you were hearing Terry Pratchett, and occasionally he looked around and Terry nodded. And the reason why Terry thought he couldn't do it, although he had very few flaws in his expression, he feared that he might not be able to get the words in the right order at a key point. And that, it seems to me, is the fears that uh, all of us live with. Uh, if, you, if you perhaps um, uh, include motor neuron disease or, or cancer, one of the great fears that anyone has is that they're going to suffer from dementia. And the more we know about it, the more we almost worry about it. You, you, when you forget a name, when you, when you can't find your, your keys, when you check around to see, have I got everything in the case before I go away? And you, you, you reassure yourself by saying, I do, by saying, I, I did that 20 years ago as well, or I did it 30 years ago. I'm no better than I was then. But it's a, it's a symptom of how uh, all-embracing of all our lives this disease is. And that's why I'm really glad to be here in this modest role uh, for, for BRACE. So, that said, we'll go to our, to our first uh, question, and it comes from Pam Moore, who is a professor at the university. Oh, did you want to introduce Beth as well? Didn't I, didn't I introduce you, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> what it, it's very good to have a politician on the panel, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Beth, why did I fail you that way? Oh, I know why it was. It was because of the reference to Terry Pratchett. It got me off on Terry Pratchett. Sorry. <laughs> Beth, Beth is a freelance campaigner, consultant, writer and blogger and deals with issues especially relating to older people and, and dementia and your, your blog was launched after your father died in April 2012, um, D, for mentia, D, D for Dementia um, and it was shortlisted for a Roses Media Award very soon afterwards. Um, amongst her many interests is football and she's a supporter of Arsenal, which at the moment must make her feel very good indeed. <laughs> have you always been a supporter of Arsenal, or have you just decided to become a supporter? Um, no, my dad was. Your dad was, oh, that's very a... Very much a family thing, um, and yeah, it just happened this season, we, things are going quite well so far. It does seem to be going quite well. There we are. So that's our panel. Well, thank you, Steve, for reminding me, um, and my apologies, Beth, for that. Um, let's go to our first question, which comes from Pam Moore, who's a professor at the university, at this university, and she's going to, there we are. Um, if you wait for the microphone, i tell you why, it, it's tiresome. We have to wait for the microphone because everything that you say is being recorded here so that it's available for Brace to use in time to come. Okay, the question is, whose responsibility is it to care for people with dementia, individual families, or government at some level? Um, who would like to start? Beth, why don't you start on this? Point, take the microphone towards you when you speak and then put it back into the middle, as it were, when you've finished. Um, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I wouldn't say it's either or. I wouldn't say it's family or not. It's not on. <laughs> Technology, the bane of life. Is that better? No. Yeah, We got it. <laughs> that sounds better. Um, yeah, my answer was that um, I don't actually believe that it's an either or. I don't think it's um, families or government. I think it's very much a joint responsibility. I think that actually one of the biggest problems we have in helping people to live well with dementia is that we don't have very joined up health and social care at the moment. Um, and actually I think that it needs to be very much a shared responsibility. So you need a health system that can support families and a social care system that will support both the family and also the health system because we don't want people with dementia mired into the health system. We don't want them in hospital. That's not a good, a good place for people with dementia to be. So um, I believe it's actually very much about the bigger picture. And actually, also, looking beyond that, also into communities. I'm a really big fan of the government's drive towards dementia-friendly communities. 
And I think that actually we can all put our hands up and do something to help people with dementia and their families um, and to help people to live well with dementia. Uh, how far down the road are we to achieving what you want to see? In terms of joined up health and social care, um, well, Norman Lamb, um, I'm sure Steve can elaborate on this a little bit, but Norman Lamb um, has made some proposals um, towards a more joined up health and social care system. But I think it's one of the great problems we have in this country, not just related to dementia, but actually um, speaking generally about many health conditions that actually we need much more um, joined up thinking. Zara. Um, like Beth, I think that there are several answers to this question. Um, and I suppose I'd start off by saying I think that um, it's everybody's uh, concern and it's everybody's responsibility. Um, because people with dementia are us. They are you and I. They are our parents, our partners, our neighbours, the people who live in our community. And so um, taking an ethical um, and humanitarian perspective, we, we all share the responsibility. Um, and I think it's really important at one level to, to try to normalise um, our understanding of dementia um, so that we can get alongside and support people. At the same time, clearly there are specialist services and provisions that have to be made available to people who have dementia. And um, as Beth says, at the moment those are not well joined up. In the experience of the individual who has dementia, in the experience of families, and in the experience of care providers, uh, we need to do more to join up. Um, it's hard to place dementia, and we keep changing our minds, I think, um, as to where it should be placed as a long-term condition. Uh, that requires certain medical um, intervention, yes. But it's also much wider than that uh, because of the, um, the social impact that it has. And so we need to look very broadly at this. Um, and everybody uh, can make a contribution, including the individual with dementia. In themselves. your experience, are we better now, as it were, in acknowledging the existence of dementia? It used to be... Uh, when I, certainly when I was young, it was something that often was just joked about, tre treated as something, well, uh, you know, grandpa's got a bit funny, um, or whatever it might be, um, or it's people behaving rather oddly in the street, let's skirt around them. Um, yes. has, has that, with the, with the sort of development of understanding ab about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, has that, has that perceptibly changed? I think it has. I think there has been a big shift. Um, but I still think for the individual, who feels that they may have dementia. Um, there's still a lot of stigma around. People with dementia do feel excluded um, and are excluded. Um, and they are not given priority in a number of settings where they should be. So um, whilst there's a lot more um, awareness, there's still a long way to go on understanding and support and knowing how to support and knowing how to communicate about this. Because as you started off by saying, it's part of our own deepest fears and it's about facing our own mortality at some level. Seth, uh, go to our two scientists as it were in this case, Lars. Seth, uh, how do you answer this particular social political question? In general terms, I agree with everything that Beth and Zara have said. I'd add just a few points. I think the medical profession has a role initially in making a diagnosis and ensuring it's an accurate diagnosis and in dealing with health problems that often arise during the course of uh, dementia in individual patients and in providing guidance and pointing people <coughs> in the correct directions. Um, I agree with the points made by Beth that uh, if possible, um, I don't think there's anything that can replace the um, support of families, particularly in the early and middle stages of dementia. Um, I think families have a shared history, a shared relationship. They can provide reassurance, encouragement, love. And I don't think that you can replace that with any um, social care system or externally funded system. But I do think that we have a responsibility to make life as easy as possible for families in ensuring that carers um, 
are informed of support groups and the facilities are made available to uh, for to give uh, carers if you like time off from this from the sorts of pressure which um, otherwise can become completely overwhelming um, as <coughs> dementia progresses uh, um, social services obviously have an increasing role and eventually often it's inevitable that people end up in um, a nursing home and um, but that's in the later stage so uh, yes okay Mara probably taking um, a little bit of a di different direction I think as a scientist our role is probably in education and in providing information for not just for other scientists and for the, um, the real necessities to improve diagnostics and improve treatment, but also to create better environments whereby the lay public are involved with what we do and an appreciation of how we're doing it, what, what, what we're trying to move forward with. So my personal answer to that would be education. I think education. that's what we can do. Um, Steve, Steve Webb, a uh, uh, government has been identified at least having a role to play and we heard, what, part of what we heard would uh, involved resources, resources, resources in an age when the government is promising us and no one's offering a very great alternative, uh, uh, relative austerity for a very long time. How do you, in that context, uh, what's your answer to the question? Government clearly has a critical role to play and I think the fact that the Prime Minister launched his Dementia Challenge in 2012, if, if you imagine within government, every minister, everybody wants the Prime Minister to front their issue to give it a profile and the fact that he chose Dementia I think is to his great credit. Um, there was a lot in that, partly about hard cash, so for research, so the goal is to double what's spent on research by 2015, it will still be a drop in the ocean but in a sense you can't you know, almost from a standing start, you've got to make some headway. But it's not just about cash, it's for example about NHS hospitals will get funded partly on how well they treat people with dementia and how well they diagnose, this, diagnose it. Because I was very struck that apparently less than half the people with dementia actually get diagnosed. So there's a lot of undiagnosed dementia out there. And hospitals have been asked, particularly if someone over 75 goes into hospital, as well as treating them <coughs> for what they came in with, to say, well, hang on, while we're at it, shall we have a look for other things as well? Um, and the other thing that the Prime Minister's Dementia Challenge is about is about awareness raising, as you say, about education. And I think uh, what happened was that Dementia Challenge happened in March 2012. There was a report back in November 2012 as to how things were going. And I think we would all be cynical when governments give themselves report cards and tick every box. But there was some suggestion that a lot of these things that were spoken about early last year, progress is being made. But even at the end of this, in three years' time, we'll all say, well, that was a good start. Let's move on from there. The one thing that came out of what we heard earlier was, it was the, the need for more joined up uh, work in delivery of care of those who, who, who have dementia um, and uh, the question of whether or not social services and health services should be brought to, together. In fact, I think I'm right. The, although he doesn't seem to have got, I speak informally, very far with his own party, the Shadow Health Sector is making it a big pitch. Yeah. And as, you, as we just heard, how important is it to get that happenings. I've heard, I don't know about anyone else here, I've heard the, uh, the demand for this since I was, I don't know how, since I first started becoming a, a journalist. And how far have we got? Yeah. Zilch. One of the changes that's happened that will help is the move of public health into local government. So instead of health being what health people do and local government being social services, public health has now moved into local government, which means there's a set of people spending money trying to look at public health who also control the spending on social services. And in a sense, the right answer to your question about, well, where's all the money going to come from, is this is absolutely something where if you get it right early on, you save money, as long as it's a pool of money. So the classic example is people with dementia spend longer in hospital that costs us money. If you spot it early and support people early, enable people to be discharged properly sooner, you're saving money. But that only works when the, the money is combined rather than everyone's little pot. And, and, and is it achievable? I see no reason why it shouldn't be, but for the reasons you say, it's taken a long time because people are so tribal about their money. Well, when you say people, yeah, it, it is, and it, that isn't only government. That is people working in the different services. It's like in, in departments in university. I mean, wherever you go, we're all tribal. I mean, in my job, everyone is tribal. I want the money for my programme, not for that programme, even if that programme is a much better programme. In fact, particularly if that programme is a much better programme. <laughs> anyway, um, any, any, uh, do you want to come back on your own question? Um, I Can you, well, sorry, you have to wait for the microphone. 
I suppose I would say as a researcher here, I'm doing some research at the minute with carers and I think the comment made regarding the need to support carers is actually a really important part of this um, and it should be something that is a community focused And what support. is what is the support for, it's a very critical area, of course it is, yeah. what kind of support do you principally have in mind? Well, what's been trialled in Bristol is um, some work around uh, individual support for carers based on individual need, and that seems, from the evaluation so far, to be a very um, useful way of thinking about supporting them, rather than assuming that everybody needs a particular kind of break to try and... I was going to say, um, what, is, what are the range of mm -hmm. needs? That that a care that you can I presume if you're you there are sort of three or four that come to the to the top of the pile as it were of individual needs that that, that a lot of difference could be made to the life of the carer and therefore to the life of the patient or the person who's got yeah. the disease. So sometimes it is about a break and time away. Sometimes it's about an opportunity to do something different. Sometimes it's about education um, if it's a younger carer. Um, and sometimes it's about something for that person, so that person feels valued and cared for <coughs> themselves. Thanks very much. Does anyone want to come in on, on this particular point? Yes. Down here, the microphone's third row back. Just here. Yes, it's you, sir, with the glasses. Hi, I'm Namit Patel, North Bristol NHS Trust. On the issue of joining up, clearly the whole area is quite complex. Is at the national level, the central government, local level, whole range of agencies, charity sector, NHS bodies, local government, and so on. So what I call street level, again, the people, individuals, families. But in all this joining up, right, complexity, and then there is a backcloth of different areas, inner city areas, rural areas. So it's getting, whole picture is very complex, right? And, and one of the things I would expect in a panel today, there's no one from social services here, right? We've got a, got a very good panel here, right? But there's no one to kind of speak for social services. And if there's some, somebody in the audience and want to comment on the issues, I think I, I, I would like to hear that. Can I, can I ask you then, uh, 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 is there anyone from social services here? Would you feel free to comment? Yeah, but just before you do, yeah, just yeah. Get, do, do, you say it's very difficult. Yeah, no, no, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it important nonetheless? No, no, it's absolutely important. And, and I think the, 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 the structures, I know that at, at the top level, there are strategies and government is working. At local level, everybody wants to do the right thing, right? But no one to now, right, has really identified what really is important, right? Have you heard? Because most of the, what I heard up to now is what I call generic. The issues which have been around, like you say, for many years, right? Health and social care have been trying to join up right for 20 years now, and they're not succeeded. So what 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 is required is some some local level thinking, right? By the agency joining up, right? And joining up getting together they, themselves. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, they don't talking to one another. Yeah, they, they, they don't. They don't. I, I know this is a very good forum to get the process started. Okay. Right? Well, let's let's hear from you. Very kindly said you would come in, ma'am, up in the back row there. Or no, sorry, four rows from the back. You are having to learn to run. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. You are running very well, is what I meant to say. <laughs> yes, Hi, my name is uh, Beth Tovey. I'm a centre manager of social services, South Cross Council. I manage a, a dementia day centre in Yate. And I um, um, understand where the gentleman just was just saying about we need to communicate, we need to um, meet, we need to join up, um, partnership working. Okay been recently involved with some of this at a, a smaller level. We've set up some dementia road shows with the clinical commissioning group and Alzheimer's Society memory services as well as those, uh, social services. So there are things that are happening out there, but I do agree that they do need to increase. Um, and are, now, are people that you work with, you, you're yeah. obviously keen on are they keen on it as well? They want it to happen. They do. They, they do. realise it makes a difference. Yeah. Although we support the people, um, I have over 68 people that attend our day centre every week, it's where we are lacking is for the support for the carers, the families, and, uh, and they, are, they, they often come to us and say, what, what's available, Beth, you know, to the other staff? And uh, luckily I know quite a bit about what is going on locally, but they do, they do need to be aware and have that um, so understanding. So information is part of yeah. the support. Yeah, signposting is crucial. Um, you know, we're linking into the local GP practices. Um, there's, there's a lot of it is going on in South Gloucester and in the South West, but we just need to make sure that everybody's aware of it. 
Um, I'm not sure if everybody's aware that the, the new, um, they've introduced what they call a dementia prescription informa information prescription. GPs in South Gloucester are now able to access and forward on to their patients in their actual surgeries. So, and that gives um, a, a, a huge list of information for support for carers that are available in their local areas. But there, there are, um, there's work going out there, but we definitely do need to link up a lot more. And I think the more um, um, that you understand that we can cross the bridges between health and social care, we have to. It's the only way that we are going to progress forward for our communities. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to press on to our, to our next question, which comes from Barry Harvey, who's a businessman in the area. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I think he gets the only round of applause at the end, don't you, really? Hi, yes. I'd just like to ask um, if uh, you think it's realistic to talk of curing dementia. Let me uh, I think it'd come to, 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 let's come to, to Seth and Mara on this. Mara first. It's one of the biggest questions that people have with respect to Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, there is no cure for this condition at this moment in time. And again, even more unfortunately, the current therapies at most alleviate um, cognitive um, problems you know, moderately, but they do not stop the progression of the disease. The biggest reason for this is, is that ultimately for a cure you have to know what causes the condition. So even though there are significant advances um, have been made with respect to what's called the amyloid hypothesis, so these are the plaques and tangles that are formed in the brain of patients with Alzheimer's disease, and this has literally driven the way forward for these therapies and treatments. However, what has been observed is that even drugs that make it to phase one, phase two um, clinical trials, they're phasing at the larger trial, <coughs> are failing at the larger trials. There's a number of reasons that they propose this is, this is for, is that one is Can that... Can you just, for those who are not absolutely, I mean, uh, phase one, phase two is that yeah. very preliminary small yes. scale research that if it yeah. is promising, then it, it then gets funds in so that you can go to a mega scale research. Yeah. yeah. So basically, there's different stages of trials that a drug has to go through before it's um, released onto the market, if you like. So it, it gets full approval. So it um, starts off with maybe smaller cohorts of patients and then these patients go wider. Um, one of the reasons why they think that the drugs for, we'll say, the um, clearing of these plaques or removal of these plaques are failing is that the drugs are perhaps given at too late a, a period within the disease because it's becoming more evident that preclinically, so that is before diagnosis, the disease is starting to progress significantly within these patients. That, that's kind of one reason. The other reason is, is that even though the, the models whereby they test these hypotheses are, are superb, they, they still don't know for certain do they trans, translate to the human brain. And that is one question that we really need to um, focus on more. But to be fair, the amyloid hypothesis has a massive, um, uh, has a lot of, of information supporting it. Um, in addition to that, you have um, therapies which will be um, focusing on other aspects of the disease, such as the tau, the tauopathies, and these again are all under uh, under clinical trials. So we won't know for another maybe three or four years if these. Um, other treatments under trial will actually be beneficial. Does that, does that mean uh, it, that while it, it, it is not unrealistic to talk about mm -hmm. the possibility, obviously, mm -hmm. of yes. a cure, but it, when you ask if, if the t question is realistic, i.e. is it just down the road, the answer is we don't know. Um, for a cure, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that it's just down the road. However, for a treatment, and uh, that is to actually potentially delay the progression of the disease, then yes, absolutely, they, there are a lot of drugs um, currently in different phases of trials. And plus as well, you know, there's a significant amount of research undergoing all the different paths that may be leading to this condition. Okay. Because I think the more and more people research into the disease, the more evidence it's becoming that it's multifactorial. It is not just possibly one cause as such. Professor Love. Um, yes, well, I think you touched on an important distinction here, which is between treatments and cure. Uh, I think the prospect for treatments is very realistic. 
um, I think the prospect of cure of the disease is, is very distant. And that's partly because it, it is just a very complex disease. Uh, 20 years ago, we thought if we could understand more about the central process in this <coughs> disease, which is uh, what leads to the build-up of the amyloids, the amyloid beta peptide to which uh, uh, Dr. Conway referred, we would be able to cure people, and that was just a few years away. We now know that it involves all sorts of other processes as well. It involves inflammation. It involves the transport of fatty substances like cholesterol uh, across membranes in the brain. It involves the sort of garbage disposal system in cells, the way cells get rid of all of the unwanted material that uh, normally accumulates. Um, so it's very complex. But we are making progress. I don't want to be... So we very good now at intervening um, in relation to some of the upstream processes which increase the risk of dementia. We know that if you're hypertensive or if you've got heart disease or if you've got diabetes or if, if you're obese, you're more likely to develop dementia. And it's quite probably because we're becoming better at tackling those that there is recently a slight decline <coughs> in the incidence of dementia in the UK. There's, a, there's an absolute causal connection rather it's than... Not, that's it, so it's not. It's circumstantial, yeah. but yeah. I, I, say it's, I think it's likely that that's yeah. the reason. Um, can't say... No, can't that's, what I was, can't that's what I was just sort of checking. Yeah. Um, so the upstream process, as I said, we, we know an awful lot about the central processes and um, drug companies have developed all sorts of um, medicines which have been just hugely disappointing and I think there's a very good reason for it but before I come to it I'll just say that uh, there's increasing focus now on if you like the downstream processes the inflammation the reduction in blood flow the abnormality in communicating between nerve cells which is um, related to structures called synapses uh, and the accumulation of this other protein called tau and I, I think there's a lot of promise um, and there's certainly several trials underway for example in here in Bristol in relation to blood flow which I think have a lot of promise if I can come back to the reason why it's just so difficult also to cure the disease and why the drugs which intervene in the central disease processes have been so disappointing. Uh, we now know that um, the metabolic abnormalities which lead to the development of dementia start at least 30 years before there's any clinical sign of dementia. <coughs> By the time people are clinically demented, there are all sorts of secondary processes that have already started and some of these are, if you like, amplification steps. So they make everything progress much more rapidly. So it's it's one of the reasons why scientists are very concerned about trying to make a diagnosis very early mm. because it's only if we can make it well before people get the clinical disease that there's any prospect I think of cure which was the original question. Which takes us to our next, the, the panel didn't actually know what the questions were because one of the problems if you know what the questions are you spend at least, you write your thesis on them in advance rather than <laughs> thinking off the top of your, of, of, of your head so we decided not to tell them what the questions were, also it's quite fun, it's crueler. Um, <laughs> the, the, it takes to our next question, which is from a dementia specialty doctor, Judy Hayworth. Hayworth? Hayworth, sorry. Judy, down here. Thank you. Uh, my question is, the government is suggesting that as part of routine health care, all older people, particularly those over 75, are routinely screened for cognitive decline. Do the panel think that that's a good idea? I'm going to come back to you for straight away on that, Seth, because it touches on exactly what you ended up saying, but also, as you will know, it's not an uncontroversial piece of territory. Right. Um, from the point of view of treatment, uh, there is some argument as to whether it makes sense to try to screen people and make a diagnosis very early because we have so little to offer. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people do like to find out early. It enables them to plan their life, to uh, come to, uh, in, to educate themselves about the condition, to make contact with support groups. And so it does help people to adapt. But it's not going to early treatment at the moment. It doesn't lead to uh, delayed development of the disease and, uh, you know, and uh, a better outcome. On the other hand, th that's on an individual basis. Um, as I said earlier, if we're going to have any prospect of actually curing the disease, then we need to be able to identify that the disease is in the process of developing well before 
um, people have got definite dementia. So, so uh, I mean, just ideally, from the perspective you've just offered, earlier would be, in principle, if to see what cognitive impairment there is way back from 75-year-olds, it would be people Before, in their 40s. Yes, yes, uh, yes absolutely. Yeah. Just it, as a matter of principle. But yeah. it, wouldn't, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a cognitive test no. which would detect that. Um, it would be some sort of test which people are desperately trying to identify. And possibly. we still don't have that. We still we don't still have what that test we, would be. We still don't have that, no. Zara, what, in principle, the, 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 I mean, the question was in relation to old, older people being screened for cognitive decline. So we're talking about, not about what Seth, uh, uh, Seth just talked about, but slightly older people. What, what, what do you, from your experience of people with cognitive decline, do you think that would be of benefit? I think this is a very complex, uh, very, very multifaceted issue. I think for many individuals to become aware quite early on that they, that they have dementia um, would be very detrimental for them. Um, it would uh, add to anxieties and in a situation where they may feel there was very little that could be done that could actually um, be very problematic for them and the people around about them. But I do appreciate that some individuals um, will want to know and will want to know what it is they have to face up to and prepare for. Um, and I guess um, any group would be divided in their views about um, what they would prefer. Let me bring Judy back in on, on this in your role. What, what do you, how do you answer your own question? <laughs> um, I bet you've got an answer. Well, yes, I, I do sit on the fence a bit because we all respond to challenges to our health and well-being in different ways and some of us just stick our heads in the sand and don't want to know and others will take it on as a major challenge. Um, but I, I've been working with people with predominantly early dementia and cognitive impairment for a very, very long time and I actually find that if you give them a h amount of time that's long enough, most of them can be encouraged to find out what's wrong with them because then we can do something positive and move forward. How do they get referred to you in the first place? Or how do, are they self-referred or how, how does it happen that you say, I oh, this is someone who, who we have got early, as it were? Okay, m most patients come to me directly through their GPs. Um, th or through a psychiatric liaison service. It's detected service. that there is a... a, a yes, a, a, so th the screening is predominantly at the GP stage, yeah. not I'm at the, the later yeah, stage yeah, of actually making the diagnosis. And so those who, those who have been referred to, have, have they already decided that they want to be referred by the GP? Then presumably they aren't being forced to come and see you. No, they're not being forced to come. That doesn't mean to say they really want to come on the day. And ah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when they do come, you've got a psychological job as well as a medical clinical job, presumably. Yes. But I have an hour and a half. It's yeah. not like a GP's ten minutes. And you minutes. can explore. Do you explore with them what you judge their situation to be, or do you? I mean, it's like with all diseases. At what point do you say to them? I, I think you do have a, a. You certainly are suffering. You've got the symptoms of someone with dementia, and on the and the and the prospective uh, pathway is like such and such. Mm. Probably. Probably 95% of all the people I see will receive a diagnosis yeah. that spells it out for them that they have a dementia. But actually, I try to make sure that people leave with hope so that this isn't the end of life. This is actually the beginning of the next book So of your what life. do you think about, about uh, screening for older people more generally at the GP level? Uh, as, as somebody who might be screened myself if I went into my own hospital in North Bristol, um, I think, oh my gosh, I don't want this to happen. Um, but I can see from the other side actually how helpful it is, particularly if we do it in hospital, because it means people get a better discharge because we take all that into consideration. They don't have to go all the way to a diagnosis. I'm all for people being able to opt out at any stage um, of a diagnosis, but most people um, will accept if you take a long time and you have a very calm situation, um, that actually finding out from somebody in a structured, careful environment is better than finding it out from the insert in the medication packet. 
Steve, it, it, it's a political issue as well, not only but, but for, for lots of reasons, but amongst others, is that a diagnosis can have an impact on all sorts of other aspects of your life, uh, insurance uh, yeah. uh, not least. Um, how do you answer the question that it should be, I mean, if it's annual screening, it's a cost in addition. Yeah. Um, how do you, we've heard sort of quite a range of, of, yeah. of views, how, how do you, so you don't have to speak, as it were, for the coalition here. It's speaking for yourself. <laughs> well, actually, well, you'll be done over it. As, as, you're, as it's all over the web, if you speak for yourself and it's not for the coalition, you do have a mini problem, I grant you. Well, the, uh, just, just as an aside, that I've had the privilege of being on Jonathan's programme a few times, and, and then you're on a panel with people and you're trying to outshine them. And tonight, I know I'm on a panel, all of whom know more about the subject than I do. But as, as has become apparent, so does everyone in the audience as well. So, um, <laughs> but I'll give and it a that, go anyway. that, of course, is, that, that, of course, is true of the audience of any questions, that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I think a, a couple of things that occurred to me, I mean, one is, and I take Seth's point about the importance of research early on, but my sense is that if uh, identifying people over 75, perhaps, you know, at 75 or thereafter, provides people who can then take part in research, and part of the Prime Minister Dementia Challenge is telling people that there are research programmes and that they can be part of them if they want to be. So I think that would be a, a good thing. I think that um, Judy's absolutely right about discharge. You know, if it helps mean that when someone goes into the community, there's the right support there in place, it has to be a good thing. And also the impact on the family. So that if actually suddenly things drop into place, they can do their research, they can find out what they need to do to respond best. So, so it, is, it is complex. I can see the risk and the insurance one. Although, again, I'm not sure that the link between dementia and life expectancy is, is, is plain from an insurance point of view. But clearly the, the, there are potential benefits from this, but risks as well. I haven't forgotten you, Beth. But I'm going to go to ask, just, is there anyone from the audience who wants to contribute to this, this issue, who has a thought about it? Anyone wants to come in on this? All right, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Who thinks that there should be um, uh, annual uh, screening for cognitive decline for elderly people? Who thinks that should be available at any rate for all elderly people? Would you show with your show of hands? Who thinks it's better that it isn't available? Um, Pay up, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Overwhelmingly. I'm going to let you get in on it. Yeah, you, 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 I, I'm let you get in on it <laughs> but I'm going to go to Beth first. Correct. I knew you'd want to get in on it again. <laughs> well, my dad went 10 years without a diagnosis, so you would imagine that I would be quite keen on screening. I'm actually not. Um, I've come out against it. Um, and I've sat on some of the government's groups that are looking into the issue of um, how we diagnose dementia and at what stage we diagnose dementia. Um, the National Screening Advice Service currently does not recommend screening and as um, I think Seth touched on there is actually no reliable tool at the moment. We have a very multicultural diverse society. Um, there is a very big danger that if we go down a screening route, um, which I don't think is rec uh, recommended by the WHO either at the moment, the World Health Organization don't recommend it either, um, there's a very big danger that we will misdiagnose a huge yes. swathe of the population. Exactly. We will diagnose a lot of people with mild cognitive impairment, which will yes. lead them to believe they're going to get dementia. They may never get dementia. They may only ever have mild cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. um, I think until such time as the um, methods for screening are far mm -hmm. more watertight than they currently are, I don't think it's a good idea. I totally agree that it's completely wrong that so many people go without a diagnosis. It would never be acceptable in, in conditions like cancer, for example. But at the same time, what is also equally unacceptable is all the people that are currently diagnosed, the vast majority of them don't have enough support. Their families don't have support, they don't have support. So at the moment, if we implemented screening, we are going to throw a vast wave of the population down that same black hole of no support, no help, no advice. Um, and I just feel that at the moment we need to actually look at, at getting that element right. Um, we certainly need to improve the access to GPs for diagnosis. Um, a 10-minute GP consultation is not an ideal way to um, go down the, the beginnings of a, of a diagnosis of dementia. Yes. Um, I think a lot of GPs feel very um, unhappy. Um, the Royal College has come out very much unhappy that they feel that they're very much being seen as the bad people in all of this, <coughs> that they're not diagnosing 
um, enough people with dementia. But I think part of the solution to this is to raise awareness. I mm. imagine this would be a, a, something we'll come on to later on. But actually, I believe that rather than having everyone into their GP's surgery and asking the mandatory questions, what I would much rather do is actually raise awareness of dementia within the entire population. Do you think, Make people, do you think people, when you say raise awareness, what do you think it is that people don't know that it would be useful if they did know. There's all kinds of misnomers about dementia, Jonathan. It's things like, you know, it's, it's a natural part of ageing and there's nothing that can be done and things like that. And people tend to stay away from their doctor because they, they believe that. I think actually if we get out there and we actually improve basic awareness of what dementia actually is, that it's not a natural part of ageing. Yes, we all forget things. I forget things. That doesn't mean I have dementia. It's, it's about actually a bit of education within the population in the way that we've done with cancer, really. I mean, how many people now know how to identify particular types of cancer? They will check themselves and they will then go to their doctor. Now, cancer used to be hugely stigmatised. Dementia is hugely stigmatised, but there's no reason why we can't move from the situation we're in with dementia now to the situation that we are potentially in with cancer now. You know, I think that, that leap can be made. And the Prime Minister's Dementia Challenge has helped to put it on the agenda. Um, G8 Dementia, which I really hope we're going to get onto later on, will hopefully be the really pivotal point at which we actually really see dementia discussed on the world stage for the first time and hopefully we'll make some really good advancements then. We have to bring it in as politicians do in mm. answer to another question. Um, <laughs> and certainly it, it happens to be the case and cancer, they, they're rather proud of the fact that my father in 1965, before he died of cancer, was a very famous public figure was the first public figure to say I have cancer mm -hmm. and it had a it was on the front page of all newspapers and it was regarded as being seminally important in beginning mm -hmm. uh, the process by which people yeah. ceased to be regarded as taboo mm -hmm. and uh, a consequence of s uh, s the sins of the fathers being visited upon their sons which is quite widely held held view. Mara Conway you wanted mm -hmm. to come in. I feel quite passionate about screening and the role it plays in, in both diagnostics and in treatment. Um, for, the, for the elderly, because I think that's what the question was, the 75s, then I, I, I'm reluctant to, um, I, I think I can see your point, I understand why it is important. However, I'm with Beth on this one in the sense that the tests, are they robust enough in the first instance? And when somebody is given a diagnosis, What's, what are you going to tell them with respect to treatment and their, their outlook? So, um, furthermore, with respect to mild cognitive impairment, do these people actually, or will they definitely go on to develop Alzheimer's disease? So now you've potentially told somebody, yes, you know, you have a problem with your memory. This is more than likely, or most possibly, probably, Alzheimer's disease. So there, that person has that stigma attached to it, and they're waiting. They're waiting for the signs and the symptoms. They're waiting for themselves to be pr getting progressively worse. I appreciate that people who are probably at your clinic are probably gone beyond that step but those who are in the GPs may not be at all and you're creating a lot of stress to a lot of people and I'm not quite sure whether it's worth it because I'm just curious are the tests robust enough perhaps maybe at that level a bit better but certainly not preclinically I do not think that the tests are robust enough and um, furthermore also false positives what if you falsely diagnose somebody as positive That's and equally true. false negatives <coughs> what if you say you don't have the condition but yet they go on to develop it so again it's it's all about that, 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 that last mm. point, it, it, mm. that's not dissimilar from the issue in relation to screening, which is much more highly developed yes. um, in breast cancers. Absolutely, yeah. without a doubt. Let me go, let me go back to Judy. Every Just test has a limitation. Le, 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 your own, having heard that, your, your response to it, Judy? Uh, well, the, the kind of people that I see in my clinic are those who are already persuaded mm. because they've already been through the GP service mm. and the G they've agreed to <laughs> referral to the clinic. Um, as a researcher, I kind of feel I really want those people with very, very early dementia to come mm. to see if, or mild cognitive impairment, mm. to see can we change things mm -hmm. to make life better for them in the mm. future. Yeah. Um, but I also think that kind of this concern about screening is part of the stigmatization of dementia. Mm. Um, and now we all do breast screening, cervical screening, it's kind of so normal now, everybody knows about it and talks about it, and I, I think until we're prepared to possibly 
see people with dementia in a bit more light. Mm. They're no more different than us and just they forget their I PIN numbers I appreciate more than that, I do. But the, the thing with, with cervical cancer and breast cancer, the treatments are at a f far more advanced than they are for those with dementia. Okay, I'm going to, we've got a question that's come in from Ian Popperwell um, here, which is as follows. If people with dementia are thought of in terms of their illness, how would they possibly be able to continue to be understood as citizens, family members and friends, etc.? Um, Zara, if they're thought of in terms of their illness, how can they be continue to be thought of as... It, that must be quite central to mm. the work in which you are uh, engaged. Yes, I, um, I appreciate this question very much um, because I, I think that we are forgetting that many people are living with dementia um, within their family, within their home, within their community, um, and they are managing with the support of um, people around about them. Um, Neighbours, family members, carers, volunteers. Um, and so, yes, it, it, it is important because the, what we would want for everyone is that they would stay in their own home, in their own environment, uh, where things were familiar, um, not to have to move from there for as long as possible. That's what we would all want. So how do we, how do we try to build on that? And, uh, and I think it's really important that we put effort into thinking about that, um, as well as the medical treatments and the other advances. So um, we have to think about how we can uh, keep people within their networks use the networks that they have, um, bring understanding and awareness and support um, to understand dementia and how it affects people into those networks. It might be that, um, you know, an individual goes to, goes to the pub regularly and people know there what to expect and they can offer support and be appropriate. It might be that someone continues to go to church and the people around about them in church understand or that they stay being a member of the golf club, or whatever. So, you know, we do have to understand that effort has to go into um, keeping people's normal routines for as l normal for as long as possible, and that's really, really important. Thank you. I just want to bring in another question, because there have been a number in this, in this area. Ute Leonards, um, you're a researcher here, at, here and... Um, supported by Brace as, as, as well. You, you, I tell you what, give us your question and then give us your answer and then I'll get them to respond. <laughs> Go for it. Cut out the middle no, I actually <laughs> that's, that's what you want to do, isn't it? <laughs> no, I actually no. want to hear the answer okay. from the panel. Okay. Um, we've spoken about the fact, yes, there is no cure, that cure there's no treatment. Um, but actually, what can we do? How can we make our communities um, the surrounding, more dementia-friendly environments for people to live in. Um, Beth, why don't I start with, with you on this? So it's picking up from what, some of what we've heard already, but it, we, we talk about making environments more friendly. How? Yeah, there's, been some, there's actually been some great work done. Um, Joseph Foundry Foundation in York um, did a fantastic Dementia Without Walls project. Um, and actually speaking about what people with dementia can do, um, there's a gentleman called Norman McNamara. Um, he was diagnosed with early onset dementia and he has pretty much single-handedly made Torbay dementia friendly. So that goes to prove what people can do. I think this goes back to what we spoke and about how, earlier. And how is it, uh, what's he done? That made it, that, that um, he's pretty much contacted every business, every organisation, every service and he's basically educated them in dementia. He produced a document which was very easy to read about what dementia actually is. Um, he um, formulated something called Dementia Awareness Day, um, which happened on the 21st of September this year. Again, just about raising awareness. He's had his local media on board. He's even been to 10 Downing Street and met the Prime Minister. So that goes to prove what people actually can do. My concern is that we don't actually have pockets of good practice, that we actually make this replicated across the entire country. Um, I think Alzheimer's Society currently quote, if I'm right in thinking, about 20 
communities which they consider to um, be some way towards becoming dementia friendly. Um, launched at the end of last year but really properly came on stream this year was something called Dementia Friends. I hope <coughs> some of you are wearing your Dementia Friends badges this evening and basically mm -hmm. that's an initiative fronted by Alzheimer's Society um, but um, funded by um, the government and it's basically um, educating people in dementia at a very low level of knowledge in a sense but a very essential level of knowledge it's, it's those really basic points like dementia is not a natural okay. part of aging that's very s s steve it's what with with as so often this is this it, the communicating of a good thought or a good initiative which ought to be you know it's always paradoxical here we have all the, you know there are people listening watching this on websites on mm. facebook picking up tweeting communication technically mm. is beyond compare with mm. even a decade ago and yet mm. ideas are getting it from the Torbay you said it was a new um, well Torbay have become dementia friendly but dementia yeah. friends per se is yeah. across the entire yeah, no, no, UK. I mean, I mean yeah. You take the Torbay example and they're, they're 20. Getting that out so that it happens elsewhere is one of the great frustrations mm. of those who are d d delivering any kind of service of this sort or wanting to get more information in an important way across. And I think there's no substitute, I mean, you can use technology, but for first-hand, face-to-face encounters. I mean, um, Beth, who spoke from um, a social services perspective, didn't mention that she's won national awards mm -hmm. for the quality of care that she provides in Yate. And uh, I visited with a bunch of flowers, and then someone else turned up with a bunch of flowers a fortnight later, because mm -hmm. we were also proud of what she does. And in, in the local area, for example, just up the road in Bradley Stoke, there's a sports and social club for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I've been there, and I've played table tennis with a guy, and he was just a guy who was far better than me at table tennis. <laughs> He happened to have Alzheimer's, but uh, you know that wasn't relevant. And uh, you know, how, how good um, are you at um, table tennis? <laughs> good deal to worse. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, th there's um, memory cafes around the area. One in Thornbury that I went to, and and it meant that volunteers were helping out so they were meeting people the families and so on were supporting each other and you were just doing what you would do with any group of people of that sort of age whether it was you know singing songs or reminiscencing or whatever it happened to be so it's not defining people in terms of their condition it's just doing social things and m treating people as people anyone else want to come in on this area we're talking about yes gentleman up there the blue shirt thank you i'm aged 80 and so uh, I've had various illnesses and hip replacements and whatnot. I'm also a widower, I live alone, I've got a supportive family, and I also belong to a men's group. There are four of us here this evening, and our average age is 79.9. <laughs> 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 so you're the, the old one, are you? <laughs> <laughs> We're one of those groups, you know, we have fun, put it that way. And, uh, but the thing is that I'm quite encouraged with what I've heard so far this evening. Obviously, I accept there is no cure. I also accept there are a lot of people working hard to try and determine the best way forward to maybe slow it down or do things of that nature. So that encourages me greatly. I also hope that uh, this is an, an international favour because there's an awful lot of money being spent by various governments all over the world, often chasing, in my view, the same, uh, the same answer. You know, is there international cooperation on this uh, on this scale. Also, what I would also like to say is that uh, being a men's group, um, we talk uh, of men's things and uh, uh, unfortunately we don't talk enough about dementia and uh, it's something which we should talk about uh, and I would be most encouraged if I could learn some, I will, I will, I will learn a lot more this evening about uh, help which can be given to people of our age. Can I ask you, d just uh, the, the fact that you have a lot of fun and you get to go to the men's group, what, what made you decide to come, come and participate in this this evening? Well, over the years, uh, uh, I, we've, we've all done little tests on behalf of Brace. And in fact, I remember go undergoing one test and there's questions I had to answer. And the first question is, what is the name of this hospital? <laughs> well, I was answering the questions, and the thing is, it was, it was, it, I knew it, it's Snowden Road, but it had changed its name so often that I <laughs> 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 what the name of the hospital was and another of our members he forgot the day he had to turn up for the questionnaire so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, we are, we're all used to that sort of thing, but that's the group that we are. Well, I can um, see why you are a group that enjoys entertainment. You provide it in that one last thing. Um, just, but just on the series, the series point of cooperation, international cooperation, is also something that, would, that we that I think you wanted to touch on anyway, Beth. But as Seth. How much of this money is, is just being spent three times on the same thing? I mean, it's questions often asked of, of research work generally. Right. Um, can I answer the first question before I turn to the You money? answer which it is, as you like. Which is, the, uh, in fact, uh, um, dementia research is one field in which there's a huge amount of international collaboration. Um, there are some <coughs> aspects of research which are highly competitive, but, um, for example, um, all of the recent advances in the genetics of Alzheimer's disease and also the genetics of Parkinson's disease have only been made possible because groups in the UK, mainland Europe and North America have pooled their resources uh, in order to obtain very large numbers of samples in order to conduct the sort of analysis that is required. So um, I think you can be reassured on that count. Um, the other thing you said is that lots of money is being poured <laughs> into dementia. And I think that's a, that's a misconception. Um, I've never heard yet a, uh, a scientist or a professor at university <laughs> say that too much money is coming to me. <laughs> but realistically, we're dealing with um, a disease which is going to affect many more of us, for example, than cancer. And uh, When you say that, I'm just very intrigued by this, because the, the statistics on cancer mm. suggest that by those who are living in the United Kingdom in 2020, mm. Within their lifetimes, 48% mm. of them will expect to be diagnosed with one or another of the cancers. Yes, uh, but that includes, for example, uh, prostatic cancers. Sure. Uh, most yeah. of which, most of which, are not going to have an impact on their lives. Whereas what I was talking about are diseases which are going to have a serious impact on um, people's and did, lives. And do you have do you have a statistical figure then to help? what you've just said to illuminate the... Well, I think you, you gave some statistics yeah. right at the outset. The, the, one in, the one in five at the, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, over the age, yes, of, age of... Between the age of 80 and 85, something yeah. like uh, 15 to 20 percent of yeah. the population. That's almost one in five people, as yeah. you know, it's a very have huge dementia. Number. That's very high, and it's a figure that continues... Yeah continues to climb. Sorry, carry on. And I, th and I would suggest that uh, that would have a much more substantial impact on those people yeah. and on um, their families than... I, I don't want to diminish cancer. Uh, no, I don't think you need to be competitive about it. It's I just, just ca carry on with the more, the more general point that you're making. Yes. It's very, very large numbers and, and the money is... You and I, and you've, but you've diverted me. I have to <laughs> make an excuse. Because, because uh, I mean, Beth made the point earlier in relation to cancer and I think these uh, just I don't know 30 years ago when somebody was told you have cancer it was regarded as a death sentence mm. I think most of us now especially you know leukemias mm -hmm. uh, an awful lot of cancers we have an expectation that in most cases we will be cured so it's it is something which is has changed dramatically, and I very much hope that the same applies uh, to Alzheimer's disease. But in relation to money, so it depends on which source y you look at, um, but uh, it's something of the order of either between one-eighth and one-twelfth of the amount of money gets invested in dementia research as the amount of money which gets demented in all forms of cancer yeah, research. Yeah. So, I d so so I don't think lots of money is being poured on it in relation to the size of the problem and the complexity of the problem. Beth. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on the point you made about, you know, what are we doing I outside of the UK worldwide? Um, I was at a meeting at Downing Street last week um, to discuss the um, Dementia G8 Summit, which is planned for the 11th of December. Um, not wishing to plug the government, I think it's an entirely non-political event as far as I'm concerned. This is about what's good for people with dementia. Um, and it will be the first time we've ever had a dementia G8. It is primarily focused on research, which will therefore enable to bring together all the major players in research in the world um, to share information and to hopefully come up with some sort of consensus to go forward. There will be other things that will hopefully be touched on as well. For example, care, and support and also the issue of dementia friendly communities as well because we really need to learn not just blow our own trumpet about what we're doing and we are doing some really great stuff but also learn what other countries are doing 
and actually see if we can replicate some best practice, see what actually will work um, across the world um, to actually try and improve the lives of people with dementia and also crucially look at these issues of, of treatment and cure as well. Anyone else want to come in on this before we go on to our, to our next? Yes, you want to come, come back on your own territory. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether we are not missing a trick here. We're talking about, you, you talked very nicely about you know, the initiative which comes from people who are diagnosed early and um, the way how they embrace living with dementia. But <coughs> what we are not really doing quite, oh, oh, we're starting, but we're not doing in maybe to the extent we should do it, is to understand actually how patients with this diagnosis, how they experience the living, what is going on around them. So for example, things like um, the environment, the built environment, the city, the noise which gets bigger and bigger, the, the whole you know stressful environments. Um, what we do to that and how they actually interact with this and how they can deal with it. And the reason for it is because we haven't understood yet what the relationships are. So would we have to go back and say, okay, parts of the funding, parts of the targeting for research needs to go into such directions as an, you know, as an addition to finding treatment, finding cure, making our environment actually more livable um, in a physical sense. By yeah. discovering what would make it more livable yeah. and then being able to have policies that respond. Yeah. Come, come in, Zara, you were nodding your head at that. I think we have still got so much to learn about the environmental um, impact on dementia. Um, we're learning a little bit, but there's so much to learn about um, the impact of, of sensory memories. Um, and uh, the, because people's um, ability, people's vision changes um, as they get older and uh, we're not picking up um, some very obvious things that, that, that we become partially aware of, but we're not really um, uh, applying that in the, the care environments, for example, in a lot of our care environments for people with dementia. We need to understand more about how uh, people's senses are affected um, by various types of dementias. Thank you. Um, we've got time for, we can't get through all the questions that have been coming in, but we've got time for, for, for one more. Um, and this is from Fiona Bolt. Fiona Bolt, over here. Hello. Um, could each of the panellists suggest one thing that we could do to fight dementia? Now, that is, gives you a range of options. There's only one thing. It's one of those horrible questions that you know there's many more than one thing you would like to do. Would you actually want to know what the one thing is that they would focus on? Each of them what they would focus on. The one thing. You can only do one thing, okay? It's your, it's your desert island disc final choice. Um, um, who would like to start on this? Myra, you're looking like someone who would definitely like to start. <laughs> Oh, I've got so many things. But the one thing that I would like to see a massive development in is diagnostics and in more the diagnostics of the preclinical stage for dementia. So, again, like Seth said, if we can identify these pa people at an earlier stage, then those treatments that have less an effect um, at the um, more severe stages may have more an of an effect. So if we can improve diagnostics, not only can we help with the, like the actual diagnosis, but also to monitor treatment, which is something that is significantly lacking and we really need to improve that. By virtue of that alone, those treatments may become <coughs> more, more, um, more, uh, more fruitful in, in the long term. So definitely diagnosis. Steve? Or diagnostics, I should say. Um, I think given our host tonight, support brace. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, as, as, as the locals in the audience will know, obviously a Bristol-based charity, but funding vital research, as we've heard tonight, uh, Mark, the chief executive and his team, do a super job in raising awareness, in publicity and fundraising, getting volunteers aware, you know, there's so much what you can do, but in, in what Brace are doing, we're seeing making a real difference. So that's one thing we could do. And Brace doesn't operate principally inside your constituency either, does it? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, Zara? I think it would be 
um, to try to increase an understanding of um, how the various stages of dementia impact on, on caregiving um, and the things that we can make a difference in and the things that we can't make a difference in. I think it's really important that we should try to understand that um, so that we're uh, giving effort to the things that really matter. Seth? It seems so tempting in my position to say uh, do more research, but <laughs> just because it's so tempting I think I should say something else and I think I would plump for education because an awful lot of things fall out of that. I think the more educated the general public are about dementia and what it's like to deal with dementia, um, I, I think all of the other benefits flow from that. So we've been talking about dementia-friendly communities, and I think there's been some emphasis on physical infrastructure, sort of signage, transport, uh, stimuli, and all of those sorts of things. But it seems to me the most important aspect of a dementia-friendly community is having people in the community who understand about dementia and they know how to minimize the stress and anxiety on people who have dementia and to provide support and to provide encouragement. And also if we educate the general public, they're more likely to be um, uh, willing to spend more on research. So I think research will be <laughs> as a result. Two for the price of one. Yes. Okay, uh, and Beth. Um, I would say that we need to learn to listen to people with dementia and their families and their carers an awful lot more. I think they should be at the forefront of policy formation and implementation. I think if we actually learn from the people that are living the experience, as somebody who lived the experience for 19 years, I think we will actually make much greater strides towards actually getting the type of... Um, living well with dementia that we really want. Um, there's a really inspirational lady who I recently wrote about called Kate Swafer in Australia. She's living with early onset dementia. Um, I actually met her when she came over to London in August. Um, she is an amazing person who can teach everybody so much about what living with dementia is actually like. And I think, I mean, she's making some amazing strides in Australia with the work that she's doing. And I just think there's so much value in actually understanding the personal lived experience. Thank you very much. And that we do we do have to stop there. We've 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 overrun by 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 a bit. I just add my one penneth three times if I had. A had to choose what to do. I say communicate 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 <laughs> well I will, wouldn't I and that's what they've been doing terrifically I think and very grateful for all five of you for that very grateful for all your questions sorry those we didn't quite make Andrea Tales for instance who was uh, was talking about education as a way of offering free uh, suggesting free lifelong learning um, because of the effect of persistent using of the brain cells beneficial effect on those who, who are suffering from dementia um, and uh, the questions about which we did touch on the drop in the instance of dementia um, does this mean that we're doing better or the previous figures weren't quite were, were exaggerated and public attitudes that was from uh, Costa Chard. The other was from Dr. Emma Keith. So thank you from the University of Cardiff. So thank you very much. I didn't leave you out because you were swans in Cardiff, I promise you. Um, um, uh, it was only a matter of time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being a great audience. I hope you found it as interesting, intriguing, stimulating and helpful as I have to say as being in this position, I have. Thanks very much. <laughs>